Hi, this is Bill Freibogel. I'm a guest of your firm today. Um, and here I've been asked to speak on the subject of uh, joint representation. That's mainly a conflict of interest topic, uh, but it has many different aspects, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, first of all, a little bit about my background. Uh, I started practicing in Chicago at Ross and Hardy's, which uh, was in the building right next to your Chicago office. It was then called the People's Gas Building. And what was interesting, uh, when I was a young lawyer there, they uh, People's Gas was planning on uh, this building, where your office is, being the, the new People's Gas Building. And uh, Ross and Hardy's was going to have the entire top floor of of this building. Well, history uh, went in different directions and people didn't make the plunge. And so this building was built uh, without it. Uh, I, uh, w I practiced in litigation uh, for a good long time uh, until 1988 when I joined Alas. And Alas is the uh, malpractice insurance company that insures uh, medium and, and large law firms around the country. And when I joined Alas in 1988, uh, Thompson Coburn was uh, either it was either a member then, or had just become a member, or was about to become a member. Because I remember uh, vividly working uh, with Jerry Sandwick uh, when he was the last uh, representative from your firm. Um, when I started uh, with the last, my job at the last was uh, loss prevention, that is uh, advising uh, member law firms on what they needed to, to do not do in order to stay out of trouble. Uh, and my mentor then was uh, Bob O'Malley, a former partner from Covington and Burling. Uh, Bob, uh, right away, at day one, set, instructed me to start learning the ethics rules, and particularly the conflict of interest rules. And of course, the big question mark went on over my head, well, what do the ethics rules have to do with uh, loss prevention? And as it turned out, and I learned very early, it had everything in the world to do how when I talk to a law firm uh, about a, an issue they have, uh, we always go right to the rule first. And that was that absolutely, the, because if, if they're in violation of the rule or if they're about to do something which would violate one of the ethics rules, uh, then uh, there would be a problem from a liability standpoint as well as all sorts of other standpoints, you know, disqualification, and we'll talk about disqualification a lot uh, during this hour. Uh, but also uh, discipline. You, uh, you can be disciplined for having a conflict of interest or violating ethics rules. In fact, you can be uh, disbarred. Uh, so uh, I've learned uh, over those years with the last that the ethics rules are absolutely uh, critical. Um, I left the last after 12 years in uh, 2000, and largely I've been on my own since then, uh, working with large law firms ethics issues. Uh, I was for a period of about four years, I was working for Aon, uh, doing the same thing I did for last, loss prevention. Uh, Aon uh, is a, it's not an insurance company, it's a broker, uh, but Aon was broker to the largest law firms in the United States, including uh, the premier New York City law firms, and I got to work with them on their ethics issues uh, for those years, and, and, and I've, in fact, I've worked with them since I've left. Aon. I've been a solo uh, uh, since 2006, again, uh, spending all my time uh, working with law firms and, and, and uh, staying out of trouble and, and complying with, with the ethics rules. Um, we, the, the way this is going to work, uh, I, I've kind of split up the joint representation issue, issues into uh, uh, in litigation. Uh, there's a whole set of issues regarding uh, representing more than one person or entity in, in, a, in a lawsuit or any kind of litigation setting. And then I'll talk uh, uh, about non-litigation, the business practice setting. Uh, and uh, in the course of this, I'll also talk about uh, you don't think you have a joint representation, but you've managed to, through either carelessness or, or just not keeping your eye on the ball, wind up with more clients than you thought you had, and so that's a, yet another kind of joint representation. Uh, this is an example of, uh, of a litigation uh, kind of pratfall. Uh, 
case is Yanez versus Plummer. I've given you the site on, on the slide. Uh, Yanez worked for the Union Pacific Railroad, and he was working with a co-worker named Garcia. And uh, uh, he and Garcia were, were working on a locomotive, and they were switching out a, a, a motor, I mean, an electric motor, on one of the axles of the, of the locomotive. And while they were doing this, uh, Garcia slipped on some grease and fell and hurt himself uh, and, uh, and was injured. And, and so he brought an FELA case against the Union Pacific. And for those of you who don't know about FELA, basically it's a negligence action that railroad employees can bring against their employers. Uh, and in this case, uh, keeping the, the floor clean and not being, having grease on it, and they didn't do that. So that was uh, the, the gist of the negligence case. Well, Yanez, because he was there, uh, was uh, uh, going to be, have his deposition taken. Uh, and so the lawyer for the Union Pacific was an in-house lawyer, a guy named Brian Plummer. Uh, Plummer had Yanez come to his office uh, to prepare for his deposition. Uh, and uh, Uh, Yanez expressed concern to Plummer that uh, uh, he uh, uh, he was going to be testifying and really basically negatively about uh, the, the railroad because of the, the, the grease on the floor. And uh, Plummer said, look, I hear you. Uh, don't worry about it. Just tell the truth. And I'll represent you at the deposition. So Plummer put himself in of representing not only the railroad at the deposition, but also a plumber. During Yanez's deposition, uh, he testified that he was with Garcia uh, when, uh, when he fell, but that he did not see Garcia fall. Well, uh, Yanez had been interviewed by railroad investigators before uh, when the case was first filed. And he gave contradictory. He gave uh, contra he basically contradicted himself in in one of his statements where he said he did see uh, uh, Garcia fall. And when this came out during the deposition, uh, Plummer, his lawyer, instead of of trying to stop the deposition and try to work out what you know why there was a discrepancy. Uh, Plummer started cross-examining uh, Yanez, his client, about the contradiction in his, in his statement and his, his testimony. Uh, and uh, Yanez's boss, uh, a super a, a foreman or some, something of that nature, was in the deposition. He was a company representative in the deposition. And he uh, uh, observed this occur and he commenced a proceeding after the deposition. Commenced a proceeding to discipline Yanez for uh, his discrepancy, and the result was Yanez was fired for dishonesty. Uh, so Yanez turned around and sued Plummer, uh, his lawyer, for malpractice. Uh, the case uh, was in the California State Court. Uh, the trial judge uh, granted Plummer a summary judgment. And then uh, guess what happened on appeal? Uh, the appellate court says, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, this uh, Plummer was Yanez's lawyer. Plummer owed Yanez absolute fealty and a duty to make sure that his testimony would not harm him uh, going forward. And uh, so the, uh, the appellate, California appellate court, in the, in the cited opinion, uh, reversed the trial court and sent it back for trial. Where that stands now, I don't know. Uh, I do know something else, though. Bef after I prepared my slides, uh, I received uh, an opinion from a uh, California uh, bar judge pursuant to a disciplinary proceeding that was brought against Plummer as a result of this conduct during this deposition uh, and during this case. And the uh, disciplinary, uh, 
the, the uh, California bar judge, uh, based upon all the things I've just described, found that Plummer had uh, violated uh, his duties to his client uh, under Rule 1.7, or well, it's comparable. It's in California, it's 3-310 is the rule number, and uh, the, the and, and found that uh, Plummer should be disciplined. Now, because uh, of the, the lack of seriousness of the conduct, the, the court uh, merely recommended that Plummer be uh, admonished or given a, a reprimand as a result of this. But the opinion's available, and if any of you want that opinion, the bar judge's opinion, let me know. Um, what are the lessons from the uh, Yanez case? Uh, certainly, uh, those of uh, you who do litigation uh, have undoubtedly done this. And that is, and when you're representing an entity or an employer in litigation, and uh, there's going to be a deposition of a company employee, uh, you try to uh, represent the employee, and there, there are a number of reasons for doing that, but primarily because you want to have some control over what happens uh, in the deposition. Uh, if it becomes appropriate to instruct the witness not to answer, for example, if the questions are invading the attorney-client privilege, uh, that's a, a good example of when uh, the lawyer for the witness can instruct the witness uh, not to answer uh, the, the question. So it's not unusual for, for that to happen. Uh, now, what, what do you do uh, before that? Uh, one of the things you do is you confirm that there is no conflict between the employer and the employee. Uh, there are a number of ways of doing that. You can do it through the HR department of the company. Uh, you can talk to fellow employees uh, to make sure that the person who's about to be deposed uh, hasn't done something uh, one-off that's inappropriate that would be different from what the company's expectation was. Uh, now, in this particular case, in the NS case, uh, it later developed that there were in the Union Pacific files, now it isn't clear whether th these files were available to the in-house lawyer, Plummer, uh, there were conflicting statements by the Yanez as to whether he had or had not seen uh, Garcia fall. Uh, I mean, he clearly was there, but he did, you know, that, the question was whether he actually saw the, the guy fall. And uh, that should have been a red flag right there for, for the lawyer to say, we've got to straighten out this discrepancy, and if we can't, uh, we're going to have to, I won't be able to represent uh, the witness. Uh, the next thing you need to con be concerned about is where you have a joint representation. This could include litigation and non-litigation, and we'll, we'll come back to this point uh, again. And that is you've got to deal up front with what happens if you learn from, from one of the, these people uh, something that the other needs to know, but it's something that the first person uh, wants to be kept confidential. I'll talk about that a little bit, a uh, little bit later. The uh, w one of the things I've heard uh, about the Yanez case is is well, he really wasn't a full client. Uh, he was just an employee. He he just happened to be there. He you know the only reason the lawyer wanted to represent him was to you know for the de purposes of the deposition uh, and. That's something that both the appellate court and also the bar judge said no, nothing doing. If you declare that you're representing somebody, they're your client, uh, full bore. Uh, there is a rule, ethics rule, it's, un, it's under 1.2, I forget what subsection, but under 1.2, a lawyer can limit his or her involvement, and but that has to be with full disclosure and concurrence uh, with the client. And of course, none of that occurred here. Plummer just said, don't worry about it, tell the truth, I'll represent you. Uh, and then, of course, the next issue is what, what should Plummer have done when he, he realized during the deposition that his client, uh, Yanez, was contradicting himself? Uh, should he have stopped the deposition? Uh, maybe later withdraw from representing uh, Yanez? And uh, he, he obviously ignored all of those issues blundered into uh, the fact that he wound up uh, cross-examining and embarrassing his own client, uh, Yan S. Uh, there's another case like that, and I'll pull that one up right now, uh, sort of like that. Uh, 
this is a case called Zador versus Quan, and it, it also is a California. I, I don't mean to pick on California or, or ignore the rest of you, but uh, Zador is the well-known case nationwide, and it's, and it's uh, cited frequently. Uh, uh, just last month, the New York Supreme Court judge cited Zador on, on similar issues. Quan uh, was an agent for Zador. Was, Zador was a company in a real estate purchase. Uh, and after the purchase was completed, there was a, there was a lot of litigation uh, over what the price should have been. And the, the, I think the purchaser uh, or the seller brought an action against both Zador and Quan. They were they were uh, both defendants. Uh, Heller Ehrman, a well-known California firm, uh, undertook to represent both Zador and Quan, the co-defendant. And of course, Zador was the primary client. Uh, Juan was sort of an incidental client, like like Yanez, uh, but he was a defendant and he and he was a client. So what Heller Ehrman did is what something firms should do, uh, and that is get an agreement uh, that uh, if there's a conflict, uh, the law firm can withdraw from representing the, the lesser uh, uh, party. And stay in for the long time regular client. In this case, withdraw from um, representing Quan and stay uh, with representing Zador. Now, at the time, uh, the law firm didn't know that there might be a, an issue between Quan uh, and Zador. Uh, time to advance slides. Uh, they discovered, the law firm discovered during uh, discovery that Quan had really uh, behaved dishonestly. I forget it, what what manner, but basically had defrauded Zador. And uh, Heller then withdrew from representing Quan, and, uh, and there was a counter, Zador had filed a counterclaim, and they joined Quan as a defendant in the counterclaim. Uh, of course, Quan, uh, having been a former client, moved to disqualify the firm, Heller Ehrman. Uh, the trial court uh, granted the motion, and it went up on appeal, uh, just guess what uh, happened in the appeal. Uh, the appellate court reversed and said that agreement that Heller hammered out uh, with Quan and, uh, and Zador was effective and that it, it, in effect, Quan agreed in that agreement that uh, the law firm could withdraw from representing Quan and could continue on behalf of Zador. Now, the implicit in all of that was that the law firm might well use information it had learned from its former client, Quan, in the course of pre preparing for the, the case. Uh, and But the appellate court said that works. And and, and, uh, and I'm sure that your, your ethics people, your conflicts people, uh, have counseled you on that. And uh, it's, whenever you are thinking about getting involved in a uh, uh, joint representation, you need to address the issue. Of, of confidences. I know the estate planners, uh, when they represent husbands and wives, for example, at the same time in estate planning, uh, will get them to agree that uh, there will there will not be any any confidences between them. And we'll talk about that further when we have a chance to talk about the uh, the ethics rules that are apply. Okay, uh, back to Yanez and, and Zador, the two different cases. Uh, in, in those cases, they were uh, co-clients, uh, and uh, but where you have uh, different firms representing, well, let's see now. What? It, what oh, yeah, Zador in, in those cases involving co-clients, uh, you may have a situation where. Uh, two different firms represent the same client. Uh, for example, your firm uh, uh, doesn't do intellectual, I, I'm not sure what, whether you do it or not, but you need to bring in a lawyer with a special expertise into your case, and so you have to go outside your firm and bring in a lawyer from another firm uh, and to be co-counsel, of course, and, and to advise on, on, on the IP issues or whatever. Uh, but then, uh, Somebody makes a motion to disqualify one of the two firms, 
and that firm is disqualified because maybe it had done work for uh, the other side at some point, and the court said that's a substantial relationship type conflict. Uh, the issue then is, is the other firm who's co-counsel for the one client, uh, is that firm disqualified? And the answer, generally speaking, and it, by the way, let me, well, I'll, I'll talk, talk about my website in a moment, but generally speaking, uh, courts have held that just because one co-counsel is disqualified does not mean the other is disqualified uh, unless there was an exchange of, of client confidences, in which case that has to lead to uh, disqualification. Uh, I want to mention my website. It's called Freivogel and Conflicts. And if you type my last name into Google, that's all you have to do, that site comes up. It's out there. It's free. Uh, and uh, among other things, it has pages on co-counsel and joint defense. I'm going to talk about joint defense, right? Uh, the doctrine used to be called the joint defense uh, doctrine or joint defense agreement, and it started in criminal cases where uh, you had, a, say, uh, two defendants, A and B. Well, they each hire their own law firm, and uh, they, they decide that they can form a united front against the prosecution. So they agree to share uh, information, share confidences, and share strategy. Uh, and, they, and they proceed to do that. Uh, that doctrine has, has grown in, into a doctrine which, uh, in all sorts of contexts, not just criminal defense context, and it's developed a new title which is more, more generally more uh, appropriate called common interest. So, so in the common interest doctrine, uh, uh, parties with similar interests can agree to exchange information. And by the way, when they do that, they don't waive the attorney-client privilege as to the other side. Uh, now, they do sort of waive it as to each other. Uh, and if they ever get crossways with each other, then, uh, uh, then a lot of that information that they exchange can be used against them. Uh, but at any rate, so we, we, we go back to the issue I mentioned earlier. Let's suppose... Uh, the, uh, one of the law firms uh, is develop, has a conflict of interest of some sort with the with the other side, and, uh, and that law firm is disqualified. Does that automatically then disqualify the other common interest law firm? And again, the law generally is that uh, uh, that the disqualification of one does not automatically disqualify the other unless there has been an exchange of of information uh, dealing with the, uh, uh, the firm uh, complaining about the, the, uh, co the conflict of interest. If you want to read about this stuff, there's a, there's a, a terrific opinion uh, in the Third Circuit called Teleglobe. And what interested me about this opinion, it, it, was, it was written by Tom Ambrose, uh, a former partner at Richards, Layton & Finger in uh, Wilmington. He was a business lawyer. I met him in the context of, uh, of, uh, of business opinion. Uh, but he undertook, in the course of, of this case, to – he must have done a lot of studying and homework because he discussed all of the doctrines we've been talking about, uh, common interest doctrine or joint defense, joint representation, and the whole business of co-counsel. And he explained all of the things I've been, been saying here uh, as well. And he came out with this opinion, and it was, it was an awesome opinion, and I really uh, commend it to you if uh, you're interested in these, in these concepts. Uh, let me mention derivative actions for a moment. Typical derivative action is you'll have a minority shareholder uh, who's, who's, has, who's complaining about the conduct of board members or management in harming the company in which he is a minority shareholder. And so he brings an action, uh, and uh, typically the, the plaintiff uh, joins the company as a defendant, although the co their action is really on behalf of the company, and, uh, and the company is really in the nature of a plaintiff, really. But in any event, he makes serious allegations against, we'll say, board members of the company, defendants. And, uh, and it, I've done this. I've been involved in these types of situations, and the uh, the, the insider, typically the insider board members, uh, 
the ones who also are employees of the company and so forth, will hire uh, the corporation's regular law firm to defend them because they know them and they're familiar with a lot of different things. And of course, uh, it's very tempting for the corporation's regular law firm then to appear for the corporation as well. And the plaintiff will uh, move to disqualify the law firm from doing that. And uh, the law is a little unclear. Uh, I, I'm having a hard time coming up with a majority position, but I guess the majority position is that if the allegations against the individual defendants are, are quite serious, then there is a conflict between them and the corporation, and the same law firm can't represent both. Uh, so, and, but again, on, on my website, uh, you go under in, in the uh, alphabetical table of contents, Go to D under derivative actions, and you'll find all the cases I know about. Uh, the, the website has been up now for 15 years, and so uh, almost 90% of 95% of all jurisprudence on conflicts of interest has occurred during those 15 years. And, and so the chances are, are good that you'll you'll well you'll find every case there is on that, uh, including in your state if there are any any cases. Uh, on here. Uh, insurance defense uh, uh, is, has some interesting issues. I won't discuss them in any great length. One of the issues that comes up is whether or not, uh, I mean, everybody agrees that when you're brought into an insurance defense situation to defend and insured, that insured is a full bore client. No questions, no issues about that at all. The only other the only other is issue is whether or not the insurance company is also a client of the law firm. And there, uh, the cases are all over the lot. Uh, some states, they say, you, automatically there are two clients. That is the insured and also the insurance company. Other states say, no, it's only the insured who's the client. The insurance company isn't. That can make a difference in some context, uh, whether or not a law firm has a conflict of interest uh, problem. And one of the issues that comes up is um, if there's a reservation of rights, for example, the insurance company says to the insured, well, uh, we'll defend you, but uh, we think you may be subject to a policy exclusion uh, or uh, something of that nature, or you're not really insured for this, or this occurrence isn't really covered, and so forth. Uh, the uh, uh, issue can be, uh, if, if the insurance company, typically the insurance company hires the law firm to represent the insured uh, from a panel or a, a list of, of, of loyal insur of law firms that defend their insureds. And uh, the issue is, if uh, it, are there situations where the, like that where the insured has the right to bring in uh, his or her or its own uh, trusted counsel uh, to defend the case uh, at the insurance company's defense. And there the general rule is that uh, if uh, the, in defending the case, if the insurance company's chosen counsel is in a position to direct the, the defense in a direction that results in no coverage, uh, then, uh, that, then the, the client has a right uh, to uh, its own counsel at the insurance company's expense. Now let's let's move into the uh, non-litigation arena for joint representations. And a, a very illustrative case is, is this one, Baldessari versus Butler, in the uh, the opinions in the New Jersey Appellate Court. We'll talk about the, uh, something that the New Jersey Supreme Court did in the case later, but uh, the all the juicy facts of the case or in this appellate opinion. Uh, these two sisters uh, inherited uh, some very valuable suburban real estate uh, from their father this was in, in the New York City area. Uh, and they didn't know what to do with the property and they, they wanted to sell it. So they happened to be talking to their father's, uh, the deceased lawyer who had done the father's estate plan and it all represented the father and all of his, his real estate work. Uh, they asked him if they he could find a buyer for the property, and uh, 
And the, the lawyer said, sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And uh, he had a, a, a client who was a real estate developer, and he asked him, if uh, the client, if uh, he would be interested in buying the property, and uh, the developer client said, absolutely, I would uh, draw up a, a, a contract to purchase uh, the, the property. Uh, by the way, put in there that I would have the right, uh, if, uh, we, if it were to be executed, I have a right to assign my interest as purchaser to someone else. And uh, the lawyer did that. Okay, he took the contract to the two sisters uh, and said, look, uh, you're going to need your own lawyer uh, or law firm for this uh, because I'm representing this, the purchaser, the developer. And the sisters uh, said, uh, as I recall the language, look, they, they, they almost begged the lawyer. They said, look, Daddy loved you. Uh, you were so loyal to him, uh, and uh, we want you to represent us as well, and, and so the lawyer, his name was Butler, by the way, reluctantly agreed to represent the sisters as well as the, the purchaser develop, developer. Well, as it turned out, the developer client had found a, another buyer uh, who was willing, I, I think the original purchase price under the contract was like $1.5 million, and, uh, and the developer found a, another buyer who was willing to pay like $3 million for it. So he wanted to assign his right to buy the property to this third party. I forget his name now. but he, So he goes to Butler, his lawyer, and says, uh, I found somebody uh, uh, to assign my interest in. Would you draft whatever needs to be drafted? And, uh, and Butler did that. And uh, at some point, uh, Butler, uh, one of the the the, the, con the purchase contract was was complex. It had things in there about zoning and and, and sewer and a lot of other and, and, and a lot of other contingencies that would affect uh, the, the contract. And also, it had some deadlines in the contract. And the uh, uh, lawyer, Butler, the lawyer, goes to the sisters and said. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the deadlines under the contract is about to run. Would you agree to extend the deadline? And, and they said yes. Now, uh, what, uh, uh, what, what isn't clear, and, and, and this wound up as a malpractice case, uh, and, and when the sisters found out about the assignment, that is that the, the property was being flipped for twice what they were getting for it, uh, uh, a lawsuit erupted, and I forget who sued. The parties to the lawsuit were the sisters, uh, the developer client of Butler, the assignee under the contract, and, and Butler and his law firm. And they were all parties to this case. And the, uh, uh, the, the law firm wound up with a, a $2 million judgment against it. I think I, I have that number right. But I'm informed that the law firm dissolved as a result of this disaster. Uh, and, it, again, it... Uh, it uh, you know no good deed goes unpunished here. The, the lawyer said no, you need your own lawyer, and they they begged him to stay in it. Well, uh, it, it, at the trial, uh, the sisters said, well you know you Butler, you got this extension from us on this deadline, but you didn't tell us about the assignment. And Butler said, well you know I might not have mentioned to you to you directly, but I was talking to one of your husbands, and. Uh, and I told him about the assignment. Well, the jury obviously didn't buy that. Uh, so in any event, uh, that was a disaster for the law firm, and it's all in the appellate opinion. Now, the case, the, the lawyer part of the case was settled and resolved, but it still went to the New Jersey Supreme Court on other issues. And uh, New Jersey Supreme Court, even though this issue wasn't presented to it directly, said, look, going forward, in the state of New Jersey, if uh, there's a, a real estate deal and it's, quote, complex, that's the word they use, then uh, the same lawyer can't represent the seller and the buyer, even with a waiver, even with a consent and, and disclosure, et cetera. Uh, now, what's interesting is uh, that's one of the few states now where you have a definitive rule on that. I mean, there aren't very many states where there are definitive rules on representing both buyer, seller, lender, borrower, et cetera. 
changing sides. And that takes us to uh, the, the whole concept of whether a, a law firm can be on both sides of a transaction. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, the ethics rules don't come right out and, and, uh, and prohibit uh, a lawyer from doing this. As I, I mentioned, New Jersey is now one of the states uh, that, that says you can't if it's a complex real estate transaction. And if you go to my website uh, under C, Commercial Negotiations, in the table of contents, that's the page where we talk about representing both sides of a deal. You'll find every case I'm aware of, uh, and again, mo almost all of them have come down in the last 15 years. Uh, where either an ethics opinion or a court opinion address the issue of whether a lawyer could be on both sides of a transaction. There are some situations, like some, some states have recognized, if it's a routine residential real estate transaction involving not, not a develop, undeveloped real estate, like, like in the Baldessari case, but, you know, a house and it's being sold, and, and all the terms have been agreed to, and it's a cookie-cutter deal, and there nothing, there's nothing unusual uh, uh, one law firm could arguably represent both parties, uh, but uh, it's a very rare thing. And another uh, situation where a law firm may be able to do it, according to some opinions, is representing lender-borrower, uh, typically in a, say in a mortgage, residential mortgage-type uh, transaction. But you've got to be awfully careful. But as to all sorts of other kinds of uh, business transactions, the good lawyers I've talked to uh, around the country uh, avoid uh, getting involved in both sides of, of, uh, of complex deals because there are so many gotchas that uh, lawyers want to build in on behalf of their clients uh, in being zealous and, uh, and, and lawyers just instinctively know it's a terrible idea uh, to be on both sides where there's any, any, any kind of complexity or business type situation. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, accidental or unintentional joint representation, and I'm going to get into one of those situations now. It's very common, and I've encountered it in, in working with law firms around the country. Let's say uh, you get a call uh, from Moneybags. And he's a longtime client, uh, and he's, he's been very successful in starting new businesses, and you've represented him and his new businesses always pays his bills, and, and the guy's just a dream client. It's a little difficult at times, kind of a, a bully. But in any event, he calls you, and he says, I want to, I got another idea for a business. And you say, come on in, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Well, uh, in comes three people, uh, money bags, and then a, a guy we'll call inventor who's got a patent on something, a really cool idea. And then uh, I'll call her Miss MBA, young woman who's uh, going to be sort of the business end of, of this, this, handle the business end of this new, uh, new matter. Uh, and um, you have that conversation. You have that, uh, uh, you talk about the new business. You talk about whether it's going to be a corporation. You talk about the tax aspects. You talk about intellectual property aspects and so forth. You don't talk about who is and who is not the client. And then, of course, uh, as in the case of many startups, the, the new business fails, and all of a sudden the inventor discovers that somehow he, he has lost his patent or it's been impaired in some way because of the way the deal the deal was structured. So he, he sues the lawyer for malpractice, and uh, the lawyer said, "Wait a minute, I didn't represent you. You know, you came with money bags, and and uh, and you knew he was our longtime client, and." Uh, and uh, you, it, we never said we were going to represent you. And, uh, the, and of course, that's a defense. If, if the lawyer didn't represent the inventor, then uh, the inventor doesn't have uh, the usual kind of malpractice case. Now, there are exceptions to that rule, but it's called I forget, the privity rule. Uh, in any event, so the inventor has to prove that uh, uh, the lawyer was, in fact, his lawyer. Now, that's not going. it's not clear in any document. Uh, and. and it, and the way the courts analyze it, and, and the various learned treatises analyze it, is if the inventor in this case subjectively really believed that the lawyer was representing him, and he was reasonable in that belief, objectively reasonable, this is where I learned the difference between subjectively and objectively, but 
any event. Uh, then uh, uh, that there is a, a lawyer-client relationship, and the inventor does have a cause of action for malpractice, et cetera. Now, who decides that if, if it's in dispute? Well, a jury can decide it, and that can be, you know, six garage mechanics. So uh, how, now how you instruct a jury on, the, on those issues is something else again, all of which, which militates in favor of saying up front uh, who represents, who you're going to represent, who you're not going to represent. I am not a great believer in forms uh, and, and CYA letters for their own sake. I, I am not. But there is one I will not yield on, and that is where you've been in a meeting. Typically in a startup situation, but can be all sorts of other situations. Where you're in a meeting, you need to discuss who in that meeting is a client and who is not a client, and then follow it up with a letter or an email saying, you know, it was nice to meet you yesterday, uh, Mr. Inventor, uh, but it, this is to confirm our conversation where we, we said uh, uh, during the meeting that we'll be representing money bags and we'll be representing the new entity that we're going to don't represent you, Mr. Inventor, and we, and we don't represent uh, Ms. NBA. Uh, and I, as I said, that's one of the few letters I will in, absolutely insist on. But let's let's change the situation and the facts somewhat. Uh, the the lawyer says uh, in the meeting uh, that I'm going to represent uh, money bags, and we're going to create a, a corporation or an LLC. Uh, and those will be our clients, but you, Ms. Mr. Inventor and Ms. MBA, will not be our clients. Uh, okay, so you you get the, the, thing, the business set up and you're, you're working on business matters day to day, and because MBA, Ms. MBA is running the, the show, uh, you talk to her all the time. Uh, and one day, uh, she calls up and says, uh, uh, you know that new pension plan we put in place? I, I use the word wife here. I, now it should be husband. But uh, my husband, uh, who works for another company, also has a pension plan. And we were comparing notes as to which one controls whatever. And we need to know how uh, this new pension plan that you've set up for the company uh, impacts us uh, individually and so forth. Uh, and being a good person, uh, the lawyer says, I'll get back to you, and the lawyer goes down to his benefits people and lays out the situation. The benefits people uh, uh, say, here's the, here's the way it works, and then uh, Ms. MBA calls, uh, the, the, uh, or the lawyer calls Ms. MBA and says, here's the answer. Here's how this will work with your husband, so forth. Okay, then sometime later, money bags. Uh, comes to you and says, uh, Ms. MBA isn't working out, uh, but now she's got some stock, and of course she's got the employment contract that you drafted, uh, and uh, but I want to get rid of her. Uh, and so I need you, a law firm, to structure uh, a scenario whereby I can get rid of her and not get sued or something of that nature. And then, of course, the issue is, can the lawyer do that? Well, or the law firm. And the, lawyer, the law firm will say, well, we have that understanding up front, which we confirmed in writing, that we aren't going to represent uh, Inventor or Ms. MBA. Uh, but the answer will be, yeah, but that changed when Ms. MBA came to you for uh, pension advice. And she became a client. And uh, part of, uh, uh, of terminating her will involve uh, something to do with her pension. So it's substantially related. If, if it's if it's, if it's a current client, if she's a current client, you can't be directly adverse to her. Uh, if she's a former client, well, this will somewhat relate, and of course the, the term is substantially relate, uh, to what you did for her uh, when you were advising her on the pension issue. Uh, and so that becomes a real problem and a real issue, and, and you may find that you can't represent money bags and the company in getting rid of Ms. MBA. So it's, it, again, it's, it's extremely important. Now, how you avoid that result, you've already done what you should do up front who, when you said who's the client, who's not the client. But how do you, it, months into the representation, when something like this happens, I mean, do you call, do, when this MBA calls you, 
you say, now look, I'll get the answer for you on the pension issue, but I want to reiterate what we said up front, and we don't represent you. Uh, I don't know if that do you do that. I don't know. That's that's more problematic than that that upfront thing. And, and I'm going to leave it to you, smart business lawyers, to figure that one out. But you see the issue. Uh, let's talk about uh, the rules uh, that are involved here. Uh, first of all, uh, in, in in all your states where you have offices, it's Rule 1.7, except in California. The current client rule, I think, is 3-310. Uh, but I can tell you that California, California's application of these concepts is really the same as it is around the rest of the country, even though your rules are not numbered the same as other states. Uh, so Missouri, Illinois, D.C., uh, the current client rule is 1.7. And what that rule says is uh, you may never be adverse to a current client are directly adverse to a current client, regardless of subject matter. So you may be representing a, a bank, uh, defending the bank uh, in a fall-down case. Somebody fell on the bank floor and sued the bank for an unsafe maintenance, and you're defending the bank, and that case is pending, and some business client comes in and wants to sue the bank for some sort of lender liability theory. Well, they're totally unrelated. They have nothing to do with other, but under the, the current client rule in, in all states, with the exception of Texas, where you, I don't think you have an office, uh, you may not be, you may not take on that matter adverse to the bank because it's directly adverse to the bank uh, in, in a lender liability context, but the bank is a client on something. Okay, now, uh, former client conflicts uh, are a little different, and it goes something like this. You did represent the bank in the fall down case. It was the only time you ever represented the bank. That case has been disposed of. It's been uh, you haven't done anything on the case. You've been paid. Uh, that was a year ago. Now in comes a business client and wants to sue the bank on a lender liability theory. Uh, now you look at whether uh, at uh, what we call the substantial relationship test. That is, is this new matter adverse to the bank substantially related? To, uh, what you did for that bank, and the answer uh, uh, is clearly in the situation I've given you clearly not related at all. And so, therefore, under the former client rule 1.9, you may be adverse to the bank. Uh, now, there are two other rules that play in here, particularly in the joint representation context, and I'll talk about it again. Rule 1.6. Uh, is the duty of confidentiality. That's the ethics rule that says uh, a lawyer cannot reveal information about a client. Uh, and the, the wording now is information relating to the representation. Uh, California is much stricter than other states because it, its primary confidentiality rule is uh, in the business and profession statute. It's, I think it's rule 6068E. And it's been in, on the books for, I think, more than 100 years. And it says you just a lawyer just can't reveal anything about a client, period, ever. Uh, there's now an exception in there for uh, the possibility of bodily injury or death. Uh, you can reveal some things to, in order to avoid that. But in any event, you've got the duty of confidentiality. Now, there's another duty uh, which plays in here. It's Rule 1.4. And that's the rule that says you must keep a client informed about things the client needs to know uh, in order uh, to, uh, in order for that client to make uh, decisions about the representation. Now, I'm going to give you a, a exception or a, an example of where there's a tension between those two rules, and I've seen it come up. I've talked to St. Louis law firms about this one. Uh, the uh, uh, you, you've got say two two people want to go into business together, and uh, uh, they, uh, are both, they both want you to represent them, and you say, fine, your interests seem to be aligned. You've agreed on how to split things up and all of that, uh, so we'll represent both of you. Uh, and then uh, the next day, uh, you get a call from one of them saying, you know, uh, we talked about uh, possibly issuing securities in this new 
new venture. Uh, I have been a respondent in two bankruptcy fraud proceedings in four states away, you know, in some totally remote place. Uh, and I'm afraid if we do get involved in either issuing securities or even borrowing money, that I'll have to disclose that. And if I disclose that, I'm afraid that my partner, your other client, will cut me loose and, and won't let me participate in this transaction. Uh, so uh, what, do I have to make this disclosure? And of course, you're, you're sitting there, you're listening to one client say, I'm a crook, or I have been a crook, and you're thinking to yourself, boy, our other client really would need to know that. Uh, hey, I'd like to tell your partner. No, you can't tell my partner. You have a duty of confidentiality. Uh, you've got a problem. Uh, I've had that call, and I've gone through the rules with, usually the people who call me already know the rules, as smarter or smarter than I am. And, but they just want to get a, another take on just how serious a problem it is. And uh, after we have the conversation, and, and they've assured me they've read the right rules, they've looked at the right cases, et cetera. They have not told me what they did, or what they were going to do, but I've, I've suspected that in many cases they've had to go to both clients and say, we've got to stop representing both of you. Uh, for re and why? Well, we can't tell you. Uh, and that's not, an, that's not an ideal situation, but that's, I think, uh, what some of these situations will call for. So what do you do? Uh, when, you, when you get involved in one of these multiple representations, provide up front that uh, if we learn something from one of you, uh, our obligation will be to tell the other. If we think the other needs to know it, we will tell the other, and you agree to that. And you get them to sign off on that agreement. That's uh, uh, that, that's another example of a of a of a writing that I pretty firmly uh, agree uh, needs to happen. Uh, I certainly would welcome uh, questions on my my email address. Again, if you, if you can't find it, Bill Freibogel, one word, at me dot com at me dot com, and my phone number is three one two two zero three zero one one zero, and everybody out there gets one free call. Uh, and don't. Ha and if you want to find out where something is on my website, uh, and it's not intuitive to you as to the way it's organized, I'd be happy to take your call and, and explain that again, uh, free of charge.